Hello? Hi. Hello there. Oh wow, it's quite quiet. Um... Is my mic quiet? Oh, I know why. My headphones aren't plugged in. Nah, no, that'll be it. I think that's better. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, because I was hearing myself on echo before, and I was like, surely it can't be quiet if I can hear myself. <laughs> yep. Um, yes. Headphones and microphone. That's good. How are you? I'm doing all right. How about you? Not too bad. Just rushing everywhere. I think um, <sighs> the contention of today's debate was... Um, the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America permits the uninfringed right to bear arms. Are you still yeah. fine debating that? Yeah, yeah, I'm good with that. Cool. Um, so, I suppose um, to start off with, I would just um, sort of like to get down which um, interpretation of the Second Amendment we're going down with, because there's a few different ones where they have different like um, commas and full stops and whatnot. So I think uh, so, Columbia v. Heller was the first one, I believe. Yeah, that's the that's the one that's in the National Archives. Yeah. Um, so, well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. Yep. That was the one I was uh, wanting to go with, so are you fine going with that one? Yeah, more than fine. Yeah. Uh, we recording now? Um, I'm recording at the moment. Are you recording? Oh, okay. Uh, but I'm not recording. I thought it was just going to be hosted on your channel. Yeah, yeah. I'll upload it. It's a, it's annoying because I, I uploaded I recorded a debate the other day, but all the audio was gone, so I'm keeping a hawk eye on the audio in OBS here. Oh, I can imagine. It's, it's why I haven't done much recording with other people, to be honest. I'm yeah. not fully cognizant with how that recording technology works yet sadly yeah so so anyway on to the debate now um so i think um the columbia v heller thing it seems to be saying to me that a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state and comma the right of the people to bear keep and bear arms shall not be infringed i would think that would be you know those are two separate things that it's saying that you need a well-regulated militia to uh, be necessary to the security of the state, but also you would need um, the right of the people to keep and bear arms that shouldn't be infringed. Yeah, that that seems to be the interpretation that Hell has taken from that. For me, I've looked at it as because a free state needs a well-regulated militia to be free and secure, for that reason, people have to be able to keep arms for that to serve in that militia I view it through the prism of what was the intentions of the people that set up the United States what was the intentions of the people that wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and everything else when I look at it they seem to have modelled their vision of a country on the sort of citizen farmer ideal of Republican Rome and in that period, the idea was everybody is responsible for the security of the state. So everybody has to work together. And for that reason, everybody at that time had access to their own weaponry so that they could take part in um, the defense of the state. So in, in that sense, it's very obvious that people need to be able to keep their, their arms so that if the United States was ever invaded, everybody could come together for that militia. That, to me, is more along the lines of the Swiss model of uh, gun regulation rather than a sort of new interpretation that everybody has access to a gun whenever they want it, however they want it, without regulation. Um, but I mean, you're saying that um, in order to maintain this militia, everybody has to keep and bear arms, but you seem to be uh, leaving off the tacked on bit that they should not be infringed. Like, do you not agree that it does say that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed? So how would you then say that we should then fringe them? Because of that first section, a well-regulated militia. I don't think that would be there 
if it's not relevant to the rest of the thing. So shall not be infringed with relevance to a, a well-regulated militia. I mean, okay, now, it, sure I that, don't think... Oh, sorry. Surely if you're going to take the well-regulated part, that is you're regulating the militia, not the people themselves. So you would be having unregulated right to bear arms, surely. Well, the way I see it is a well-regulated militia is referring to uh, a quasi-armed force, in essence, uh, a, a trained set of people who are marshaled in the tactics of a day, who know how to fight, and for that reason, they need their weapons. So you can't take away their weapons. Yeah, but it's the people who you shouldn't be taking away the weapons from. You can very well... Yeah. It's, so it, what it's saying is, you know, we need to have this well-regulated militia to protect the state. But also, on top of that... Um, in order to have this well-regulated militia, you can't infringe the right of people to bear arms, because where else would you get the militia from if not f as a subset of the people? Yeah, so my argument is pretty much the other side of the coin of that, that for that reason, everybody who has those weapons needs to be properly trained. That it's not a case that everybody has whatever gun they want, whenever they want to use, however they want. They've got those guns for the protection of the country. And so... Those guns have they have got to be properly trained. It's got to be properly regulated. It's got to be an effective form of control rather than a system of you want a gun, here's a gun. And I also would say that the right of the people refers strictly to citizens more than anything, not with the with the idea of citizen farmers being protectors of a state. No, right, like, um... that's my inference from it, anyhow. I mean, it it seems very much to me that um, it's going to be, you know, we need this well-regulated militia, which would be the armed forces of sorts. Uh, that would be, that is necessary to the security of a free state. And because it is necessary to the security of a free state, you need um, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So we, that is like, you know, because we need this thing, we should not infringe on gun rights is the literal reading that I'm getting here. So, to a point, as I, I get that interpretation, and it does make sense, but for me, it's what's the purpose of a Second Amendment? What's it saying? What does it want out of this? Like, what's the position of this? For me, because the right of the, of the people to have guns is for the purposes of a militia, um, for the United States' armed forces, because at that point, um, there was no concept of a standing army for the United States that they explicitly said they didn't want one, which means the burden of defending the state then falls on citizen farmers. So for that reason, these people need to have access to these weapons. Once so a standing army exists, is this amendment still as strictly relevant as it is, is one question. And another point would then be, is somebody having a handgun or whatever whenever they want the same as defending the state for a militia i don't believe that it is i think that in in the instance of personal firearms for personal use you can regulate and control them now if somebody was saying that we want to form a militia and we've got this training you know where um we've got regular meetings we've got regular practice we've got our uniforms sorted and and so on i don't think you can stop them in that situation as scary as it might be but at the same time i think that's a different form of right to anybody and everybody having guns for personal use so um so if the purpose of the second amendment is to have this uh, militia i would ask what the purpose of the militia is for because surely it's trying to get down to some root thing which i think would surely be uh, given the opinions of the founding fathers that root cause that it'd be trying to get at would be to protect liberty and you know like uh, so what what do you think like this uh, militia is supposedly supposed to be doing so the militia is in this sense from my understanding of what jefferson madison and others wrote and how washington used it in his lifetime is when the um, when the executive has decided, um, along with Congress, that the United States is a threat, so in a state of war or in a civil war or an uprising, they need to raise armed forces. 
they explicitly did not want a standing army because um, I think it was Jefferson that said that a standing army is, um, I'm paraphrasing, is of great temptation to overly ambitious executives, that it's very easy for executives to use standing armies to oppress people. So any military force should come from the people so that it's the whole nation at war together. That's the militia, that every citizen now has an enshrined duty to keep the country safe. So in that instance, everybody has to have that wire, that firearm so that they can take part in the militia and contribute towards the defense of a nation. So I look at the example of um, the Whiskey Rebellion, where um, several veterans from the War of Independence considered a lack of representation in Congress and the duty, um, the imposition of a duty on whiskey to be an illegitimate use of state power. So they had an uprising and refused to pay the tax. Um, Washington raised several militias from the states and used them to put down that rebellion. That militia is the replacement of an armed force in a view of a republic where every citizen is free and has a duty to defend the state. Okay, so... Um... It's very much in the vein of um, the whole hoplite sentiment in um ancient greek city states so um you were saying there that um if you need the militia to be you know uh, in war you need some sort of protection there you know if you have like a civil war whatever kind of war you have so it is the whole nation is at war together that's why it's not a uh, standing military as sorts but you also said there everybody has to have a firearm in this uh, fight for it to be the whole nation at war so i mean that kind of seems like you are agreeing that the second amendment says that uh, your right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed not necessarily so i'm qualifying it as if you have a firearm because you're part of a militia a well-regulated militia and a formal organized militia with rules regulations training and all the other things that go into it you cannot have somebody prevent you from having a weapon for that reason now is that the same as anybody having access to any weapon whenever they want when they're not in a militia that's a dividing line that i draw now you can have guns for other purposes, such as hunting, for personal security, for, um, well, for any, for sport even. Those expressions are different from somebody having it for the purposes of defending the state. Now, if um, everybody in Texas, because we all love ragging on Texas, but let's just say Texas. If everybody in Texas decided to get an AR-15 because they all joined several militias and said, these are the militias for the defense of Texas, I would say... You cannot stop them. I don't even. I'm not even sure how much you can regulate them under this uh, reading of the amendment. That for that purpose, they're being trained. There's an, a formal organized militia. Everything is set up there. That, on a plain reading, is that well-regulated militia. Is somebody picking up a handgun just because they felt like it to go shoot bottles in the backyard the same as that right? I would say it's not. I mean, uh, this sort of begs the question, um, you know, what exactly makes a militia? Because you're saying, you know, they need, like, rules. Uh, like, So what would what would those rules need to be? Because if I just myself say, hey, I'm now founding, I am now founding the Liquid Zulu Militia, where the only rule is that I'm allowed to have guns, uh, w would that not be a legitimate militia? Um... I mean, that then comes down to how people define militia. I tend to define militia as a group or an organization with established training um, with an express purpose of defending the state, um, you know, with proper forms of authority, legal and properly legally identified and, and so on, that there's qualifications on that. A militia is different from an armed posse, for example, just roaming around or a vigilante group. Um a militia is sort of well established as, as a legal entity of almost reservist soldiers. And I think that is a pretty valid expression. And there are quite a few militias still in existence in the United States today. And they have access to some quite heavy weaponry. Although, curiously, um, 
even where militias are involved, the Supreme Court has prevented them from having access to more, let's say, sophisticated forms of weaponry. Um, I believe it's illegal for them to own rocket launchers and um, tanks and things like that, which seems like a, a very strange bent on the interpretation of the Second Amendment, because if it's a free right to own and bear any arms, surely then it, it would stand that they can use any and all weaponry that they want, as opposed to regulated weaponry. Okay, so maybe we can agree there that um, these militias, uh, do you think that they should be allowed to get some, like, you know, whatever weapons they want? Um, I'm torn on it. It depends on how you regulate these militias. How do they form a cohesive plan to defend the nation? Do I think any militia that applies for it should be allowed to have tanks? No, I don't. But if we're talking about the United States replacing a standing army with um, militias, then necessarily they would need to have access to this weaponry simply because everybody else has it. I, I can't imagine the United States trying to defend their borders in a war with weekend soldiers in essence just using ar-15s when everybody else is driving tanks over them it it seems counterintuitive and it's part of the reason that a lot of people do feel that the second amendment is to a point redundant um so um it seems to be tying a lot back to uh, this idea that the purpose of a militia is to defend the nation so like you know what do you think would count as defending the nation? So, like, you know, if the government decided that it wanted to start gassing Jews, would you be allowed to, like, defend the Jewish population against the government? Absolutely. In that in that instance, it's a duty of every individual to stand up for their civil rights. Um, I know it's, it's a very common argument from the right that if Jews had guns in... Um, in the build-up to the Holocaust, they would have been able to protect themselves. But in, in um, I think Three Arrows did a really good um, video on that to explain why that wasn't the case. It is quite an extreme example, but that is there. That is what part of the reason that a militia exists to prevent a government from ever being able to do that. But the minute the United States adopted a proper standing army, the, ne the necessity of a militia start to dwindle. And when you compare it to today's... Um, United States Armed Forces, considering the size of them, their role, is a militia really relevant anymore for the defense of a nation? I would probably say no. And in today's modern world, with the way weaponry and armed forces exist, I just don't see how you can ever have parity between a nation with a militia and a nation with, um, with like a very modern armed force. I just don't see how that works. So, um, so you're allowed to. So this militia would be within its rights to stop the government from gassing Jews. But what else would it be in, within its rights to do? Because, like, you know, would it be allowed to stop the government from collecting taxes, for example? Well, this is the age-old argument with militias that it's part of that idea of the consent of the governed. It forms part of the social contract. Um, I mean, this is what the first rebellion in the U.S., the first insurrection, was about. Um, George Washington, in his role as president, um, with the Congress, attempted to impose a tax on whiskey. Veterans of a war considered that to be an illegitimate use of power and rose up. Washington used militias to crush them. Who is the more valid expression there? It, it really does depend on which side of the philosophical point you come in. And I would say that generally, um, it any use of a militia rising up against the government has to be extremely qualified, has to be very, very cautious in their exercise of force. It's not something you do just because you don't like something. It's it's the end stage, really. Like, theoretically, even in Britain today, we still have that right if we consider an unjust government, but it's not something that realistically we can use. So, I mean, you're saying it needs to be extremely qualified. Like, so how qualified would it need to be? Because, I mean... So let's let's get this out. Of the way. Do you agree that taxation is theft? No. Why not? I mean, it's the price we pay for civilization. How can it be theft? We we as humans need some form of state to order our dealings. Um, 
because sadly not everybody is capable of protecting themselves not everybody is ever going to have access to um enforcement for contracts so at the very least a state needs to exist just to enforce that it then stands to a logical reason that there are other guarantees within the social contract that the state needs to follow all of that requires funding which is taxing tax is our contribution towards each other to ensure that we can all live in peace and prosperity together that's uh, not theft that's just a, a basic understanding of how human society works at least that's my view of it so i would ask um uh one how exactly do you define theft like what what would be theft and also you said that um we need a state in order to order our dealings uh because you know not everyone can protect themselves but i would ask you know what not everybody can necessarily uh, farm, farm their own food. Not everybody can necessarily afford food. So should we also have the state provide food to us? I mean, as a socialist, I would say that it's probably a good idea that basic human necessities are provided for by the state. But that is, um, let's say, not the mainstream interpretation of it. At the very least, the state has a duty of care towards its citizens. It, that that's the basis of a social contract that in exchange for providing a safe place to live in exchange for enforcing the law that we all agree upon in exchange for our consent of the governed uh well our consent to govern we then give up this right of um universal enforcement um i think it goes back to what hobbes said about the state of nature that it, it's a brutal and miserable place because everybody has their own right of enforcement over their own rights we surrender some of that um executive power in exchange for that power being qualified so we can't use it other people can't use it and together it means we've got to live in a more civil way i don't see how that's necessarily a bad thing um so uh in relation to like you know um you're saying uh we kind of need the state to protect us and whatnot what if I don't want the state to protect me? What if I just want to live on my own? Am I allowed to do that? Am I allowed to just live atomistic away, away from the state? I mean, people do that. They do go completely off-grid and far away and, and so on. But then you're coming into a situation of, um, you know, is somebody who is educated in a country, paid for by taxation, kept healthy, at least while they're growing up in a state, educated um, by taxation and all of these things, do they have the right to simply say, no, I refuse to take part? I mean, theoretically, yes, uh, but then you're getting into moral questions that don't really have a bearing on most people's lives and in the end would end up creating a massive set of problems where people tend to be okay with all of this during good times, but as soon as something inconvenient happens, no, I don't consent anymore, I'm withdrawing it, sorry, bye. I mean, uh, surely uh, and you are allowed to withdraw your consent at any time from any sort of interaction. Like, I mean, if um, I was in a relationship and I was getting a lot of good things from this relationship, but then I didn't like the relationship anymore, I'm surely allowed to call off that relationship. But a personal relationship is completely different from a state individual relationship. Why? I mean, a personal relationship is based on two equals. The state is not your equal. It never is and never can be. Are they above me? It's not necessarily. It's not a case Are they below of me, then? somebody being above or below. It's a case of being different. The state is of us. We consent to it, but it's not the same as us. We give our executive rights to the state in trust. But uh, what if I stop giving my consent to the state? Because I'm currently not consenting to anything the state is doing. What happens now? Because I'm not consenting to it, because your entire argument is predicated on me pre consenting to it, but I don't consent to it. So this is where the democratic process comes in. You've got the right to then mobilise your opposition to this and use that democratic expression as a, a way to step up and say that, right, we don't agree with this, this is why, and eventually through voting, that expression is either upheld or not. Uh, do you think democracy is like a legitimate way in order to validate some sort of action? Yes and no. Um, I, I'm not one of those that doesn't see the flaws in democracy. There are, there are a lot of flaws in democracy and they do exist. I think the people that seem to think that there aren't any are really 
need to get a reality check. But at the same time, I think it's the most valid expression simply because it draws the widest base of consent. Now, as a benevolent dictator, I could go and make Britain into a completely wonderful place, but then it's trusting that I'm not going to abuse that power. Whereas in a democratic state, I've at least got the right to change my leaders if I think that they're doing the wrong thing or taking the wrong course. Okay, so you said there that democracy has the widest base of consent. Would a market not have necessarily a larger base of consent because every market interaction is consensual? No. It pre it presumes that everybody in a market exists on an equal platform, which they don't. And why does that matter? Because then coercion exists through a completely different form. So I think unless you radically redistribute all resources and land, there is no way that anybody goes into a market, a, a free, unregulated market, with any form of equality. That these theoretical rights don't make sense in that sense, simply because at the end of the day, not everybody is going to be on equal footing. If I live on, I don't know, say, the Yorkshire Moors, where it's very good for sheep farming, but little else, and somebody lives down in um, East Anglia, where it's very good for wheat farming, when not on an equal platform, we're never going to be on an equal platform, especially if um, there's a drought in in Yorkshire and uh, you, you're then pushed towards a necessity that you can't meet. Uh, so why does this equal platform matter? This equal platform matters because how then are we supposed to enforce our right that everybody's equal before the eyes of the law? The whole concept of it is that we should all be treated equally. We should all have um justice and access to justice you can't enforce that in a free and regulated market um i mean you can't enforce that everybody has justice in a uh, democracy because there will necessarily be a minority which can very easily be robbed from in a democracy so you can't just so this applies to both systems where but in a free market there is the incentive to provide uh, justice to everybody is there? Yeah, because you profit from it. But that predicates that profit isn't um, gained from exploitation in that situation. Because you can make far more profit from slavery than you can somebody being free. Because you don't have to pay them wages. Uh, but if you have somebody who is enslaved, then they're going to be working far less efficiently. Eventually it gets to the point where an efficiency of scale with slavery far outweighs um, somebody freely working especially if it's in manual labor where the drop off in efficiency isn't really that you know that massive slavery from a purely capitalist perspective if you're looking at it just from straight efficiency slavery makes more sense than paying workers high wages well i but uh, that that's completely abhorrent well i would vastly disagree with that but i suppose it's um i just kind of want to get down to um why exactly where do you think there'd be exploitation in the free market model, which I would propose where you would have no sort of, um, where you would ideally be wanting, uh, no co no, um, uh, fuck, I forgot the word, uh, no, uh, conflict. That's it. So yeah. Where do you think there's exploitation inherent to the market? Well, it depends on your expression of the market. In this form of, because I consider myself closer to a, a market socialist more than anything, I'm, I'm a bit weird to sort of box into any sort of one idea, but when it comes to what I would presume is a libertarian view of a market, um, exploitation is inherent simply because there's no barrier on that exploitation. Um, to, in almost any sense, it makes perfect sense to exploit someone in that situation. So say that I have a farm, um, it's on the richest land in, in the district. Um, because of that, I make more money than anybody else. I can then start buying out other farms. Eventually, my power is of such, I make what I decide goes. That's early autocracy. That's where those concepts come from. Um, but I don't see where the exploitation comes in there, because you said you have a very profitable farm and you buy other people's farms. Where does the exploitation come in? So everybody else then being born doesn't have access to land, doesn't have access to anything. They're, all they've got then is they've got the choice to either work on your farm, leave, or starve. 
So you can demand anything you want of them, and they either have to give you it, give up their home, or starve. But I mean, you didn't get here aggressively. I don't see what the problem here is. You you benefit them by agreeing to this trade. This is this ties into the Austrian observation of um, mutual profit in every single trade. So uh, to describe it, imagine I go to a hot dog vendor and I give the hot dog vendor five dollars in exchange for hot dog. You know by that trade that I value the hot dog more than the five dollars, and that he values the five dollars more than the hot dog. So we both profit in that trade. Every single voluntary trade has mutual profit in the ex ante sense. That's assuming that mutual profit is always the gain. And it also assumes that um, you can make a choice free of any coercion. If your choice is between starving and giving up your rights, the instinct to survive tends to take over. And people do give over their, give up their rights in that sense. So is that still the same freedom? Just reaching complete control through non-violent means doesn't um, say that that complete control is still right. It just means that you've done it in a way that has gotten around implicit, vi well, explicit violence. Um, I would say that the the hot dog argument, while nice, doesn't apply simply because you're not talking about just a simple transaction. In that sense, yeah, that does work. But if you extend that and extend that out, then it stops working on on the larger scale. Just because you then have people with such huge control over such huge patches of land or resources or really anything that their opinion necessarily counts for more. And then you get into a situation of how can justice ever be enforced if that person ever refuses to accept justice? Okay, so you're going over that this um, thing of, um, you know, if I don't accept this deal, I will die. So therefore, it's not really uh, a gain. But I mean, if I am going to be saved by this deal, I think I profit massively so I don't know why that would be a deal which would be bad for me to take. That uh, that is a deal where I am, my life is saved. But also, you're saying like you know there are these people with huge swaths of land, so that they will be, um, you know, they will be able to basically do whatever they want. And I think this ties into the economic calculation problem, which uh, you touched on earlier with um, the where you wanted the state to provide food. So I think we should go on to you know going over the economic calculation problem and why that kind of limits the size of your control in a free market because as your business grows as your firm grows internally you have no prices so you don't know whether you're being efficient or not so what'll be your response to that sort of thing the incentive is always there for a business to crush alternate innovation so if i'm amazon um well, actually no we do see this with amazon today the, the incentive for Amazon is to either buy out a competing business or, if they refuse, copy their product, undercut them, crush them, and then raise your price on that. The economic calculation problem is a nice idea, but at the end of the day, it only applies in very small and limited circumstances. Whether something is efficient or not, according to the market, doesn't necessarily matter if it's not judged in the same sense from the person who's making that decision. Uh, okay, so um, I understand, I agree that you have an incentive to crush uh, your competition and whatnot, but um, you know, you cite Amazon there. Amazon does not exist in a free market. We are n nowhere near a free market at the moment. And um, you also touched on predatory pricing there a little bit. And I think uh, predatory pricing is a strategy which fails on both historical and logical grounds. So... I would say that we're closer to a free market now than we've been in over a century, um, easily. Just in terms of sheer regulations, regulatory burden, all of that has been reduced. We're, we're to a point now where companies are a lot freer to act within uh, or whatever purview they want. Um, I don't really see how that's in, in doubt because over the past 40, you know, 40 years now, since 1979, so 41 years in really, um, the continual trend has been to deregulate and continually de deregulate. Amazon absolutely exists in um, in a completely free market. How could it not? It's the continual accumulation of goods. It might be slower. It might be quicker. It, it depends on circumstance. But as we've seen time and time throughout history, that eventually people continue to, you know, growth continues. 
And as that growth continues, people accumulate more and use that power. Nobody's just going to sit on it. That's why we have laws, that's why we have regulations, and that's why we moved away from that sort of model initially. Uh, so you're saying we're closer to a free market than we have been in a century because there's been a uh, reduction in regulation since the 70s. I think you said 79 or something. Um, yeah, 79. Uh, so I would like, I vastly disagree. I think we were uh, far freer, like, you know, in the early, late 1800s and uh, early 1900s, you know, we had like, very deregulated markets all over the place there were still a lot of regulations i agree because you know the u.s government loves to regulate um but also you said that amazon it does exist in a free market and i would ask what exactly you think a free market is then because to my in my view amazon is no nowhere even close to existing in any free markets i don't know where there would be a free market today well for me the the way I understand a free market as libertarians and um, ANCAPs tend to describe it is um, a market that exists free of regulation and state control, that people have the opportunity to sell at whatever price they want, buy at whatever price they want, and um, everything is determined by sellers and buyers. Um, excuse me. I would say that in that situation, um, whilst it does sound good on the premise of it, when you dig down into it and you start to look at what happens in certain situations, you then look at it and argue that, well, maybe this isn't actually the best idea. If everything is for sale, you're continually going to get undercut and certain industries wouldn't survive. You've then got a situation of who guarantees rights. If everybody is responsible for their own enforcement of rights, how are you ever supposed to effectively guarantee other people's rights? You're relying on voluntary organizations to do something that the state does already in a far more efficient way than it would if everybody was left to their own enforcement. It's that Hobbesian principle again. And, you know, I don't fully agree with um, with Hobbes, but he, he was right that that transfer between the social contract and enforcement of executive rights is quite important. Okay, so... um. You said in terms of what a free market is, you said it is a market free of regulation and state control. And I'd ask just like this atomistic question of how exactly do you think Amazon is operating free of regulation and state control? So, no, I'm not saying that um, Amazon exists completely independent of it. I'm saying Amazon, in if a free market existed as people would want it, and Amazon would still exist. Um, it's illogical to assume that they wouldn't simply because that accumulation will always continue that uh, we only need to look at um, the 1920s and the period of the robber barons to see how it does happen um, as you said that period was one of uh, high market freedom in that period conglomerates grew average wages started to decline and only really changed with the crash of 29 and okay. it, it was after the, the crash of 29 that we started to regulate coincidentally the same period of the highest um, point of american prosperity was that period from 45 46 onwards till about the stagflation crisis in the early 70s okay so you brought up the robber barons there <clears throat> oh sorry you brought up the robber barons there uh, which of the supposed robber barons do you think was uh, truly a monopoly? What do you think like characterized the monopolistic uh, tendency of that period, like a company, for example? Well, it's it's kind of difficult to, to describe because they weren't all monopolies in the sense of outright monopolies. It was just the case of they grew to such size that they acted more um, of an oligarchy really it's similar to this day that google is completely outweighed in its influence on the technology sector particularly with search engines um amazon is completely outweighed in its digital marketplace if you can call it that and its production of goods to be sold on that digital marketplace um i see that as an inherent threat towards democratic expression because we're getting to the point now where large multinationals can dictate to other nations and 
if a state is supposed to exist with the consent of the governed and that's our expression is it right that a private entity um a corporation that exists solely for its own profit can divert our free expression of our wants and rights because it profits them or it costs them i don't think that's fair and i don't think that's right nor does it work for us in a society um i would drop the example of um philip morris and australia Australia wanted to regulate cigarettes because it causes harm to health. They wanted um, plain packets. Philip Morris sued them, and because of the ISDS mechanism, um, won in a US court. I don't think it's right that a private company can tell um, a government on a mandate from the people that you can't do this because it, it infringes my profit and effectively damage the government because of it. Okay, so um, in relation to the uh, examples of the robber barons, it seems you know you're bringing up a lot of modern examples of like you know Google and Facebook and all these guys, but like you know specifically like back in that era, like you know let's say Vanderbilt, would you say that he is one of the uh, robber barons that you'd be worried about? Yeah, yeah, uh, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, Carnegie, Ford, Hill. Um. Do you want to know what? Um, I'll, I'll bring up a couple of uh, quotes from the time. Hold on, I gotta bring up the document because I'm actually writing a paper about this at the moment. Oh, that's cool. I'd love to read that paper when you eventually drop it. Yeah, it'll be dropped later today. I'm just recording ah, the audio right. for it. Uh... So like Rockefeller had um, Standard Oil and roughly 90% of the refineries and pipelines in the United States in the 1880s was controlled by John D. Rockefeller. Hmm. If John D. Rockefeller decided he could cut off all of the oil to the United States, sure it would damage his, um, his uh, economic standing, but it also gave him explicit control over, in essence, the pulse of the United States. Uh, but you want to know a little factoid here? Um... John, his 90% share, that was his peak share, and it actually dropped down to 60% by the time the Supreme Court got around to ruling about to whether he's a monopoly. So uh, clearly not um, any sort of uh, surefire monopoly there. And I can bring up uh, Vanderbilt here. Um, so was that his share in the company of Standard Oil, just to clarify? Or no, share that was of... the market share of Standard Oil. Oh, okay. So what I would say is that 60% is still a significant amount. But it was dropping. Not... It was dropping quite a lot, uh, though. Yeah, I, I would argue, like, I, I haven't looked into it, so I can't say specifically, but if, if I was Rockefeller in that sense and I knew that they were going to be looking at it for a monopoly, I would be divesting and divesting to people that I would have effective control over. That That's just logic to me. But whether he did that or didn't, I can't say, and I'd, I'd need to look into that. But it it's this essence of overweighted control that if we're a society of equals or with equal rights towards uh, in a nation, then people shouldn't be having outweighed amounts of power simply because of their money. That the determination of whether something is done in our society should be whether it is right and whether we can convince people of that rightness, not whether we have access to money to demonstrate that, yeah, we want this because we have money. That, um, that sense of profit shouldn't be the determiner. Well, I don't think that, like, I don't think the sense of profit is necessarily like you know this evil thing. I think uh, profit motive is uh, a good thing. And in fact, I brought up the Vanderbilt quote, quote I was looking for. It's from the New York Evening Evening Post. They called Vanderbilt the greatest practical anti-monopolist in the country, because what he did was the way he got his start was basically um, the New York State uh, authorized that that uh, this guy called Fulton would have the sole right to operate with steamboats within New York State. And then this guy Gibbons, who was from New Jersey, didn't like this very much. So he hired Vanderbilt to operate his steamboat uh, to go from uh, New Jersey to New York uh, outside of the law. And it was so bad, in fact, that Vanderbilt was chased by the police for 60 days at one point. So, and through his comp illegal competition with this state-mandated monopoly, he was able to charge a quarter of the price. And uh, because of all this, 
Gibbons managed to take this to the Supreme Court and they ruled that it violated interstate commerce, like some uh, little part of the competition constitution about interstate commerce laws. So Vanderbilt like took out this monopoly and then he decided he saw this massive opportunity where he was allowed to compete freely. So he started he started his own company. He split off from Gibbons and he started uh, running up all his own lines. And in every case where Vanderbilt was starting his own lines, he was uh, reducing prices. And there's a, a, a quote from Harper's Weekly here. What Vanderbilt has done must be judged by the results, and the results in every case of the establishment of opposition lines by Vanderbilt has been the permanent reduction in fares. Yep, I do take that point, and I would argue that state monopolies are not a good idea. That it's very, very limited in utility, and I would say that outright state control, particularly to um, an individual, isn't necessarily the best way that anything can be run. I think the instances where the state can run things tend to be few and far between. Um, my issue is, if you then look, Vanderbilt's control over the railroads, that then accelerates down the line, and you're getting to the point then when Vanderbilt can, is the monopoly. Um, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea to have such significant portions of the economy in the control of simply one or two or a few people. Um, because, you know, with Bill Clinton's It's the Economy Stupid, it, it really is. Economic control uh, results in political control quite often um you, you end up in this situation where vanderbilt morgan um um carnegie and rockefeller and so many others could effectively dictate to the united states government if they so wished um musk gates zuckerberg bezos um, the Cokes, there's so many today that could effectively do the same and we don't know how many deals are being made behind the doors of what's going on uh, and the legislative process simply if, uh, it, you know, well actually a good example of this is Rupert Murdoch, the, um, uh, I'm sure you know who Rupert Murdoch is with uh, News yeah, he of runs the World. Newspapers and, and whatnot. Whatnot. Newspapers and, and media and everything, Fox News is one of his and or was, um, Media Corp. I think it's called News Corp or Media Corp. I can't remember exactly which, but he in the UK determine it is a strong factor in determining governments. Depending on what size his news industry takes, that helps manufacture consent. I don't think that's a good idea. He's done that not through armed force. He hasn't forced anybody. He's simply used economics and his very very smart business brain and his extremely good understanding of news and how news sells to accumulate an overly large market share. He then has a strong determiner on who gets elected in the United Kingdom. That's an outweighed influence that detracts from not only our democracy, but the way we run our state. Um, it, it causes dissatisfaction. Um, I think it was uh, Maxwell before him who did the same. That is a detractor from our state. Our state runs well when people are able to freely come to a conclusion decide who they want to govern and if it turns out that person was wrong being able to change their government instead over the past 40 odd years we've had the same consensus which was we need to reduce taxes and continually deregulate and if we cut down on immigration that would then result in more economic prosperity the opposite has happened real wages are struggling um you know consumption is down people uh in a situation now where uh, my generation are looking at being the first generation where our living standards are lower than our parents for the first time since World War II. That is, frankly, you know, an abhorrent situation. But any argument against the consensus is met against the weight of Rupert Murdoch's um, news corp. Why would that change in a free market? How, how can that change in a free market? Because in a free market, Rupert Murdoch has done nothing wrong. Okay, so... His, business acumen he has accumulated this empire and he can use it how he sees fit okay so i'm just going to go to the toilet real quick i've noted down the things you said so i'll get back to the rupert murdoch and like state monopolies being bad and whatnot so just got to go nip to the bathroom real quick be right back yeah that's cool
All right, sorry about that. I'm back now. Um, so um, as for you saying that state monopolies are a bad idea, I would say that, you know, uh, the state has a monopoly on stuff like rights enforcement and whatnot, and you were saying that that was a good idea earlier, it seemed to be. Uh, so, so I would ask you what exactly that is all about. So I would say that the state monopoly in terms of economic activity in not every case, but in a large section of cases, particularly where um, I spoke about this with Connor Boy, actually, um, we were talking about the efficiency of states when it comes to actually running business. Where the state has to make complex calculations relating to business, it tends to do badly, especially if it's handing off a monopoly to a single individual, because it simply transfers that same problem, which um, I say exists when um, an overly sized person in a market controls a significant market share. Um, it just creates that same situation, but under state control. In certain instances, such as the railways in Britain today, um, having at the very least, an, a public option, a national option in competition with a market can work. Um, even outright nationalization of all the trains or water in that instance can work. But if you were then saying to me that the government should run, say, John Lewis, I would say that's not a good idea. It's that same principle. Um, state control in that instance where it's making those complicated decisions is not a good idea because it can't necessarily function in a fair and balanced way and remain economically inefficient when it comes to rights the guarantee of the state is pretty simple we enforce these rights there is no there's no ambiguity there's no well, at least there shouldn't be any ambiguity and there shouldn't be any complicated decisions that need to be made these are the rights that the state needs to enforce this is how it does so and it that's the whole purpose of that legal system even with taxation the value of our money is derived from what we consider something is worth the state lists what that is it contains an equitable um understanding of what each currency is and because of that that's where that control comes from we we deliberately well i wouldn't say deliberately but we tacitly accept that the state makes these decisions and in essence and in response we get these guarantees we don't have any say of a, a private company but we do have a say in a democratic government um okay so um you're saying that you know the government shouldn't run john lewis as it make as john lewis makes complicated decisions but i mean surely railroads also make very complicated decisions and you also said attacking onto that was that the state enforces uh, these rights but like you know what are the rights that are inherent to you what rights is the state enforcing um well that depends on which time period and who you talk to what philosophers but obviously there are certain natural rights the right to justice the right to not be uh you know have my things taken away by another person the the right to be free from violence free from threat of violence um i would argue that the right to health exists that the right to at least the, opp the, the opportunity for prosperity exists um but again that, that that depends on who you talk to how i distinguish between john lewis and train company is a train company tends to be mostly logistics based it's um it's timetables really and making sure that things run on the right time at the right place i would also argue that a train company uh, particularly in the modern world in terms of public transport is something that is vital towards economic activity and because it's so difficult to get around it's come into a situation where overly large competitors particularly um when the startup costs are so huge um it, it coalesces into an oligarchy and in that situation having at least a public option reduces the ability of that um of that oligarchy to exploit people um, i mean we we see it all the time with the rails the argument to fixing the rails isn't more competition it's less there's a reason that european rails tend to be far cheaper and far more efficient and that's because they tend to be run by public companies where the duty isn't towards extracting every single penny of profit, the duty is to provide the best service possible while still maintaining as close to um, profitability as possible. Okay, so um, in the rights you were going over that the state enforces, you were saying that you have a right to not have your things taken away, but you also have a right to health. So I'd ask, like, you know, how exactly are those compatible? You know, let's just let's even like just take it down a level. 
you're saying you have a right to be free from theft, essentially, but you don't have a right to not be taxed. So how is taxation not theft there? That is presuming that taxation is theft, and I don't ever agree that it is. It's part of an equal transaction that we all make guaranteeing our civilization. I mean, unless everybody wants to go back to... I mean, when even did taxes not exist? We're talking pre-Mesopotamia. I mean, let's ignore the consequentialism it, uh, for, like, a bit. Like, what, what, about taxa what about taxation is not theft? I mean, the whole concept of it, really, it doesn't exist on the same principle of give me your things or I execute you uh, uh, because whoa, whoa, I whoa. want to profit what from it. What if I say give me your things or else I'll lock you up? Well, it doesn't exist on the same level. You want my things because you want to profit from it. That's and, not what... And the state wants my things because it doesn't matter. Why, why does it matter what the thief wants to do with your things? What if I want to rob you and give it all the way to charity? Have I not robbed you? Um, yeah, you have, but it's still not the same so thing. I have still robbed, so, from it. so it doesn't matter. So how am I profiting from it there? Whatever gratification you take from... Giving so, away to charity. Does that also not apply if I give it all to the state? If the state does it all? No, it doesn't. Not on the same level. Why not? Because prop property and... Well, the concept of property has always been guaranteed through force of arms. That, that, that That's the basic level. That force of arms has always protected property. Since private property existed, that has been guaranteed by people with power. How then do you stop other people from taking it? You use your power, but then that creates a necessary imbalance because you may have power, but other people don't. How do you guarantee everybody's right without creating a situation where you're forcefully um, giving everybody equal shares? You can't. In that way, taxes pay um, for everybody to be equally guaranteed by that power. Otherwise, you're then into a situation where you're dependent upon an autocrat who has all the power granting you security, which isn't the same thing. So you're saying uh, property is guaranteed by arms. So that is essentially saying might is right. So if I had more might than the state, could I take everybody's money then? What's stopping you? No, but ethically, would you think that would be fine? No, I wouldn't. So what is the ethical truth then? What What is ethically property? So you, like, it doesn't matter whether the thief has the ability to take my money, because the state very much has the ability to take my money, but that isn't in question. Do, is the state right in taking my money? Is there anything wrong going on there? No, I don't think there is. But why because... not? So don't appeal to, like, you know, they have the arms. Appeal to they have the right to take that money because X, Y, Z. Well, where does property come from? property comes Who from homesteading anybody? so like basically gives... in the libertarian sense uh you own your own body that comes so because you have this self-ownership you can therefore you therefore own the consequences of your actions so that is how you own your labor and because you own your labor you own what you imbue your labor into which is where homesteading comes from that's where i think property comes from but i mean where do you think property comes from no but then what gives you the right to own that land? Because I've mixed my labour with the soil. As, um, uh, what if somebody else mixed their labour with that soil? Oh, I've already mixed my labour with it, so I own it. So I have the right to use it however I want. So like, how do you think ownership comes into being? So ownership comes into an acceptance that this person owns this form, form of, uh, this either land or good, and that comes from an acceptance from everybody that we together accept that this person owns this. That's a, a, a democratic view of it, that we as a people have accepted that this person is allowed to own this. Well, I so, well I don't accept that the state owns anything. So it clearly it isn't everybody who accepts it. Is it the majority who need to accept it? The state don't doesn't really own anything. The state. Holds trust I mean, for if us. if the state doesn't own anything, Sovereignty. then they can't enforce any laws on anybody justly. So, like you know, if if everybody needs to accept that you own a thing, 
clearly that's never going to work because I don't accept that. What if I just say that you don't own anything at all and then suddenly you don't own anything? Would that be legitimate? No, or is it the majority who has to say that? No, it's a, it's a tacit understanding. The state doesn't own anything because the state can't own anything. The state exists as an extension of us. It's we, the people, that own these things. It's our sovereignty. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So I'm, I'm imagine this. Let's say I, right now, I'm, I'm declaring that Hypatia's Lantern owns nothing. Do you now own nothing? No, of course not. So it's something. So it isn't. Ev it, it, so it's not everybody has to agree that you own a thing. So what is it? No, no, you're mi you're misunderstanding me. I'm not saying that everybody has to agree that you own a thing in that sense. It's that we together have to agree that you are able to own these things. You can't just suddenly say that yes, this is mine. Nobody else is allowed to touch it because, well, I mean, you could tomorrow say that this patch of I don't know, Cornwall is mine, but you then have to enforce that right. So that that's how these that's how these property rights came about. That somebody put down their flag and said, "This is mine," and we're able to enforce it. But if you're then going to do that, you're then into a situation where might is right, as you said. So how do we get around might being right? We have decided that um, I, I can't say if it was a, a conscious choice, but over time we've decided that we take away selective right of enforcement, that executive right of enforcement, as a Hobbesian way and say that, okay, we each individually can't make that decision, that executive right from me to you and from you to me to enforce what I believe is just and for you to enforce is just will result in you and I fighting endlessly because might ends up being right. So we give that right to somebody of us but not us that is not superior to us but not lesser than us and we collectively are then able to determine together that this is right, this is wrong, and it is our ongoing consent through the democratic means that allows that process to continue. That makes sense. That's not theft. That's an understanding that we don't want might is right. So uh, you said there that um, ownership is when everybody agrees that you can own something. So how do you own things specifically? So everybody... Let's say everybody agrees that every single person on the planet can own things. I think that's an agreement we can both get to. So how do you go about owning something? Let's say I'm just spawned in on the planet Earth, nobody else is there, nobody owns anything. How would I go about owning something? I mean, and if you're the only person on the planet Earth and you spawned in, what, there is no ownership. You use what you want. Yeah, but how, okay. You discard so what you want. Let's say two people go down onto the planet Earth. Two people are spawned on the planet Earth. How would they go about owning things? Well, I suppose they could mark out lines of things they would like, and between the two of them, they've got to agree and disagree on what I mean, that, that um, is constitutes then, owning. That is then going back down to everybody has to agree. But you already said that it isn't everybody has to agree. So how would... No, but let, let, let's, say, let's say right now, I want to go out and homestead something. Me right now, Liquid Zulu. I want to go out and homestead something. I want to own something which isn't currently owned. How could I do that? What isn't owned in the world now? There are plenty of things which aren't owned, but I want to know what you think. You, how do you think right. ownership comes into being? So there's there's two separate things here. So one, we use an example of two people on a completely inviolate planet by themselves, completely alone. Of course, in that situation, those two people have to come to an agreement. The idea that everybody in the whole world today, now, without the legacy of everything that's gone on over the past 50 odd thousand years, needs to come to an agreement is a completely different argument because then we're removing historical context from it. Um, simply arguing philosophically on this doesn't make sense if we're not grounding it in something. Now, if a piece of land appeared out of the blue and you said, this is now mine, well, okay, how have you determined that it's yours? Where is your right to that? And who is going to agree with you? Yeah, exactly. So how have I determined that? That's what I'm asking you. How do you determine ownership? I mean, there's a concept of that you've put your labor into it. There is always that, that you have by yourself determined that you've created something out of it. Yes, you can say that you own that idea because it's yours, it's something you've come up with. But then you're getting into a situation of, uh, well, 
you're able to determine something is yours just because you say it. It's, it's not so quite as simple as that, is I'm, it? I'm not asking what I think, because I know what I think. So I'm asking what you think. How do you think that I can go about owning something? How do you think ownership comes into being? Let's say we wash up... Let's say I wash up on a desert island and I want to own a stick that I see. How do I go about owning that stick? Well, if you took it, presumably, if nobody argues against you, if nobody says, no, that's mine too, then why would that not be yours? Uh, what if I steal a lot of money from you, but you don't notice that I stole that money? Have I not stolen it? No, you still have because so uh, so it, day, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter so it doesn't matter what other people say. So how do it, I go about owning something legitimately? No, it does matter what other people say because you have taken a stake that nobody has laid claim to. Nobody said it's mine. Nobody has tacitly said it's theirs. It's existing. It's there, independent of everybody else. That stick has fallen by itself. Okay, nobody owns okay. It. Nobody let's, said that they owned it. Let's, if you took my money. Let's say then let's that's say it, money that I have already said is mine. Let's say that Robinson Crusoe had already sailed past the island, and he said, uh, "Gentlemen, I claim everything on that island is mine, but I later washed up on the island, and I want to own this stick." Does Robinson Crusoe own the stick, or do I own the stick? Well, has he marked down the island? Has he said that yes, it's mine? Has he planted his flag there, for example? Is there any way for somebody to determine that that actually is his? I'm pretty sure this was the argument of the Falklands Islands, funnily enough. So let's um, let, let's say he did plant his flag on the island. Does he now own everything on that island? Presumably. In, in If that island has existed completely independent of it, then presumably he's laid claim to that island. If there's no other, no other concept of ownership and it's completely independent of everyone, presumably he staked that ground. That's, you know, as we've done property rights through the history, that in that time would be his. So let's imagine I fi I'm the first person to land on the entirety of the Americas, all of North America and South America, and I plant my flag there, and I say, I own all of this land. Is that legitimate? I mean, from a socialist point of view, I would argue not. I would also say that it, just how far back are you going, because people as a group yeah let's have let's, in let's the, imagine the there was of years. let's imagine there was no alaska land bridge or anything like that so the native americans don't exist there is no incas there is no aztecs or none of that so let's say i plant my flag down in the americas i'm the first person there do, and i say uh, hear ye hear ye i own all this land now do i own it all no I would probably argue not. Effectively, so what how much land can you effectively control? Exactly. So there is a limit. So Crusoe just planting his flag down on the island and saying he owns the entire island. What if that island was the Americas? Because the Americas as a whole is an island. I mean, it's a continent. Well, two continents even. It's yeah, but massive. It is an, we're is not, it, we're is not it talking not an about... We're like, not talking about a small patch of land as a homestead. It, logically, about... like, this is what I'm getting at. Like, how do you know what is owned and what isn't owned? Because you're saying that Crusoe planting his flag down on a small island is fine. He now owns that entire island. But him planting it down on a larger island is not him owning that entire island. So where in this continuum does Crusoe stop being able to, to claim it? Like, this is, this is what, what I'm getting at. That This is like an inconsistent view of property where I can just plant a flag down and suddenly I own the entire land mass. Like, that is ridiculous, I think. I mean, I would say that it, it really depends on the context and the situation you're in. Realistically, what you own depends to a point in the terms of land in what you can con effectively control. That Crusoe landing on this island by himself, there's nothing around. It's a small patch of dirt in the middle of the ocean. If he plants his flag down when nobody has claimed it, nobody's ever coming near it, or anything says, right, this is mine. Well, no state has extended you know, claim over it for, uh, for a nation. No group of people have claimed it. What realistically is to stop him from saying, right, this is mine, setting up a homestead there and saying it's mine? You know, what, what realistically is stopping him from doing that? I mean, nothing stops well, him from doing it, but that's not the point. 
what you're getting at here is that what you can effectively control is yours. So that is just saying that might equals right, which you already disagreed with. No, I'm not saying that might is right. What I'm saying is that effective control is about more than just might. I'm saying that in this instance, a tiny patch of dirt in the middle of an ocean is something that he can effectively farm and use himself. A continent is so vast, no single person can ever truly extend ownership of it. You're never going to be able to be in a situation where, right, this is all mine, I can effectively control it. So you're then into a situation where you're looking at it and saying, right, how much of this is mine? How much of this is my farm? Because presumably you're applying it to homesteading. That is then his ownership. Over time, that changes as people move in, effective control changes, because it's a social right. Ownership, the very concept of ownership is a social right, just like everything. That we, whether we explicitly do it or subconsciously do it, we understand that this person owns this. How we come to that depends on the time and the context of the place. If a thousand people move to the Americas and start dividing things up, even then there is only an, um, a small amount that they can effectively use themselves. Ownership and use are intrinsically tied. So what is, um, you're saying that it ties into effective control, which is different than the might. So what is effective control? If I can effectively control um, my slave that I own, if I can effectively control him, does that mean I own him? No, because that's a person. Under your view um, of natural rights and so on, you can't effectively control yeah, yeah, yeah. a human but being. But that's under my view. Under your view, you are saying that you that's, have to just... That's under my view too. You're, okay, so how? what is effective control then? What does that well, what qualifies effective control? I was specifically to land in that situation. Effective but control in general, in general then, actually use. not just talking about land, just talking about any property at all, how do you, it, you, how do you effectively control something? What counts as effective I, control? I, I try to avoid making um, generalizations on things so vast as a concept of ownership. I don't think you can effectively make a rule that would cover the whole thing because it, it's so specific and so context dependent. I mean, your it, your entire argument comes down to this, though. So it kind of we kind of need to get through, like, what is not, not necessarily. Ownership? My argument is that, I mean, my argument is that ownership is about a lot more than just simply saying that right, this is mine, and being able to enforce it through might is right. That people need to accept that yes, this person owns this, and how we determine that over time determines ownership and the concept of property and taxation being theft relies on the idea that at its base um, everybody has an absolute right to own everything that they then put their labor into and um, you know the, the the concept of contributing towards others of surrendering natural rights as Hobbes would see it is um, it's an anathema that you can't do it Whereas I would say that as society has developed, we've surrendered those executive rights. And part of that is the understanding that those executive rights then need to lay in trust with an entity, which is the state. And the state uses some of our labor to ensure that those executive rights are guaranteed. But that that's, you, that's a social contract. Do you not see that this all does tie down to like what is legitimate ownership and what isn't legitimate ownership? No, I don't. Because you're saying agree with that. you're saying we have agreed that uh, the state uh, we have subject we have uh, kind of ceded these rights to the state. But I never agreed that. So clearly, we haven't agreed that. So what is legitimate ownership then? I've used we as in we, as in humanity, people yeah, over but, uh, time but I'm, together. I'm not. You're uh, an individual dissenter. I, in this yeah, exactly. Instance. I am an individual dissenter. So why am I not allowed to go my own way? Why why am I subjected to the thoughts of people who I don't agree with? Who I'm not? Because humans are inherently social creatures. We've never existed alone. I don't, I don't care, no I don't care that we're social creatures or anything. I don't well, agree with the decisions of my ancestors. Do you think somebody should be bound to the decisions of those who they aren't? 
Uh, no, not necessarily, but there's nothing stopping so you not necessarily. from going off so... into a cave and living on your own over there. But then if we. Are going to but then if I then if I then if I go off and live in a cave, the state will come down on me and say, "Hey, you haven't been paying your taxes this month, cunt," and they'll lock me up. So do you think that would be wrong for them to I lock me up? I highly doubt that the state they will go do up into all the mountains the fucking to find time. somebody. I highly doubt that the state will go up into the mountains to pick somebody up living in a cave to say that right, you are not paying your taxes. Let's let's that... say let's say I go into uh, the middle of Waco, Texas, and I build a house there, and then the state says, "Hey, you're not allowed to be here," and then they then they uh, raid me because I've got guns. You are living in an area that is collectively owned by. So we go a back down people, to ownership. A nation. So we go back down well, to what is legitimate the ownership. Of, the land of Texas, the whole of Texas and the United States is within the nation of the United States or various nations. But is it legitimate? On... Is it legitimate though? How did they get to own that? That's a collection of people that over time have said, we together. Um, no, they didn't say we together. They never said we together. What happened was the federal government invaded the South. That's what happened. The federal government declared that they owned all this through Manifest Destiny. It was invaded multiple times. First by the Mexicans, then by the US, and then through Manifest Destiny. It is this invasion thing. That is how they declare their ownership. So what is legitimate ownership? We keep getting back down to what is legitimate ownership. Well, you can say Texas, you can say Northumbria, you can say wherever. People together have understood that this area is owned by these people. Over time it has been invaded and we've moved away from that because we've accepted as, well, a fair amount of people on the planet have accepted that might isn't right. So we're trying to avoid invasions now. But within... The territorial entity that is the United States, the nations that live there have accepted that this is owned by this state, that this state represents the people that live there. If you choose to live there, you need to contribute towards that state. Now, if you found a piece of land that has not been claimed by anybody that exists independent of okay, everything... Okay, okay, let's, let's avoid that right now. What if, I don't, what if I live in Texas and I don't accept that? Because not everybody in Texas accepts that. There are anarchists in Texas. So what is legitimate ownership? How do I legitimately own something? Well, they've got two ways. They can either democratically move to change the rules of Texas... Of whoa, 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 no, no, that, is pre that, that presupposes that presupposes that presupposes that presupposes Texas owns the land. So don't presuppose that anything. How do I legitimately own something? I don't yet own anything. How do I go about owning something? Well, we can pay money for it if you we were talking in today's existence, or you can lay claim to it if uh, nobody has laid claim to it at all. I lay I lay claimed Proxima Centauri. Do I own Proxima Centauri now? No. How? How? Why are you not? To you reach just Proxima said that was one of the ways in which you can own. How something. do you reach Proxima Centauri? How do you reach? It doesn't matter. How do you effectively have any control over that? It no, that does, does not matter. matter. Okay. So if it does matter, include it in your definition of how to own something. So I need to actually be able to reach the the thing. Okay. So let's say I'm the first <laughs> one to reach the Americas. I have reached there. I declare it all as mine. I have reached there. So how far in do I have to reach it? I mean, you're talking, you know, you're switching from today to then, today to then. You're talking about... Because it's all the same. Being able to it's effectively... all the same. No, but it's not all the same. It's never all the same. Rights don't change over you're time. You're talking different points in time. Rights don't yes, change do. over... Rights change over time, of really. Of course rights change over time. Was slavery not always a rights infringement? I would consider it has been, but if you speak to people three centuries ago, they would say They're that wrong. slavery... They are wrong. The people three three centuries ago were wrong about slavery being a rights infringement. It doesn't matter what people think rights are. Rights remain constant. So I ask you again, how do I legitimately go about of rights owning changes property? changes over time. You can't the simply understanding say that the right changes, So the understanding, concept of the a right understanding has changes, but the head. right itself doesn't change. The understanding of that right changes, not the right itself. So how do I go about owning property? It depends upon the time. If you're if you're stepping upon something completely inviolate, completely out of the blue, then you know that what's stopping you, in essence, from saying that this is now mine. What is stopping you? 
what the only limit on you in that instance is what you can effectively control. If, but then fast forward, you then where you know you're stepping onto Texas that has been ruled, um, that has been owned, that has been invaded, as you said, that has been controlled. You can't simply just declare it's yours anymore, because there are people there, there are things there. Okay, so you were saying that if I step on the any- right to ownership depends upon the context. It's your understand. It's people's understanding of ownership changes over time. So I could, in the in the past, I could, you know, if I was a monarch, I could turn around and say that all of this is mine. So if I right? step, so if I step onto that invi- understanding has changed. If I if I step onto inviolate land, nothing nothing stops me from owning things. So, what if the the only two people on planet Earth are me and a woman I want to rape? Nothing stops me from raping her. Do I suddenly own her body because I'm able to rape her? No. So because I, her body so it, is hers. So ability doesn't well, matter. We just, we've just, so we've stop, just gone from land to you violating somebody else's body. It's That's property. Different. It's talking about property. No, but so what? So don't. So don't appeal to ability here now, in terms of property. Don't appeal to ability. You're now confer. No, hold on. You're now conferring. You're now conferring the ability to own land with the same thing as a person's body being property. I do not yes, accept that somebody's body is property. Yes, they're both the same. Property. Your body is property. No, it's not. your property. Your body you is not property. You have self-ownership. Your body is not property. It is no, that's property. Not property. That is property. You can't... You own no, yourself. it's a completely different concept. How is it a different it concept? A completely different understanding. Do, do I not How own myself? Body property? Do I not own my body? You are your body. You are you. That's so, you. so do I own me your, then? In a metaphysical sense, that is you. So do I you own me then? You, oh, not in the concept of, you know. I don't you, own you, me. You, so then you, somebody else can come along and own me. If I don't right? own me, then somebody else can come along and own me. No, because you're presupposing that you are property. I do not Everything accept that can possibly be property. property. The, no, your property I don't of think yourself. everything can be property, nor do I think that you as a human being can ever be property. I don't think that's a valid expression of property rights. Property is a thing. Then what is property rights? We keep coming back down to this. What is property, property rights? Property you keep, and then, you, then you'll go objects, along with, like, you know... Be, it's not it, an object. But then you will go along this whole line of, you know, if you're on an island by yourself in inviolate land, then you can... Basically, take whatever you want, but that is just this might versus right no, argument. You can deter- you can you can determine that that is something that you own. So I can term- that How sense, do I determine it? Well, then, because you have laid claim to it, because there is nobody else around. There is. I lay claim to the it. entire earth. Therefore, I have laid claim to it. This is not a good argument <laughs> here. I have laid claim to it, but I don't own it. We both agree. Again, this. there are limits to it. Well, what how limits? Do you define ownership? I define on, ownership. What you say. Ownership comes from your self ownership, which is uh, axiomatic. Your self ownership therefore implies that you own the co- the consequences of your actions. Because you own the consequences of your actions, the homestead principle is implied. Where if I mix my labor with the land, I own that land. That is how I think ownership is done. Except that does not always apply, and you're now trying to say when that doesn't you can it break everything down. When does it not apply? Thing. I mean, there's plenty of situations where it doesn't apply. Name one. People. How does it, I axiomatically said that people own themselves? How does it not apply to people? I mean, you're getting into a situation where you're trying to say that because you've mixed yourself into some land, that is now yours. Yes. Which I say is only valid so long as it's recognized as yours this is what i'm trying to get that is might first right social aspect to it that is might first right i I don't see the fact that other people keep going around in circles it doesn't matter whether other people recognize my property what matters is whether it is my property this is what i'm getting at what do you think is property not whether people recognize that property whether it is property Where property comes in, where it doesn't, I'm I'm not going to be able to narrow that down to a single argument because it's not. It's too big of a concept to fit into a single definition. There's so many different aspects to it. I mean, we can move on from I mean, the property you, argument there. Do, if you okay, want. okay. Let's go to your thing of homesteading. So, does that mean that you don't own the air above your homestead? So, is a plane flying above your homestead violating your property rights? 
Uh, you can homestead air too, but if a plane flies over your property... How do you homestead it, air? And by mixing your labour with it. Uh, Walter, Walter, Block go labor with air? Walter Block goes over this in uh, his Water Capitalism book. Um, so basically, if a plane, if you f go over somebody's property or go under it, that is fine. If you go through somebody's property, if you actually infringe on their property itself, that's not fine. But the if the aircraft is going over and above, it's not disturbing or damaging your land. Exactly, so that's fine. That is fine. But it's then. still transversing over your property. It's not going through my property. It's going over the top of my property, so it doesn't matter. No, but then how far does your property extend? Well, I mean, this is a continuum problem, so we can only solve it through arbitration. No, but then now you're depending on somebody to agree where the limits of your property are and aren't. Yeah, the two Which people... Which comes back to what the, I was saying. The, on, the, on, uh, the, only two, the, only, the only two people who agree in my situation are the only two people who matter. The people who are either infringing or being infringed upon. I'm not asking for everybody in society to agree. It doesn't matter. What everybody I'm else thinks. The only, the only, the only people who matter, the is. only people who matter, are those who are involved in a conflict. No, but I'm saying that people involved in a conflict are necessarily biased because they've got their own position. I'm saying that for a society to function, you, people have to agree limits, whether that's tacitly, whether that's subconsciously, or whether that's consciously, depends on the society in the period of time. There is an under, there is an acceptance of what property rights are, and people attempt to enforce those as they see fit within democratic society there is up to a point where natural rights are invoked and there is a point where you can then withdraw your consent but i would then argue that at the end of the day if you live within a, an accepted boundaries of a state your choice either to change something democratically if you disagree or to leave because that 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 area has been claimed by those people that's their property as a collective so you keep working your way back down to democratically agreed. So, you know, if you have this section of land which 9 out of 10 people agree belongs to the community as a whole, that suddenly that is valid. Uh, but earlier you were saying that Rupert Murdoch was able to subvert democracy through his, like, you know, his control of the news. And you were saying that that is a problem of the free market, but I'm saying that is very clearly a problem of democracy there. That is a problem of free market. What's to stop him how from doing is, how that in free market? Is, there is no democracy in a free market. No, but what's to stop him from doing that with mineral rights or anything else? Well, uh, explain how exactly he would do that with mineral rights, whatever that means. Whatever, well, any good you could apply it to anything, say farming. That's this is the simplest option in this. Rupert Murdoch has the biggest farm. He uses his resources, his goods, his wealth, whatever he wants, to buy up other farms. What's to stop him from continually accumulating farms and declaring all that his? Um, well, he, and, he would face the economic calculation problem. You can't just grow your business indefinitely. Or else I would right now say, hey, what stops me from buying a business next door and then buying the next business and keep buying until I own Amazon? Well, that's right. exactly what Amazon have done. The economic it's not how Amazon have done. Blown. You're, it's an overblown issue. You're saying that um, you can't perpetually grow, but eventually, once you get to a certain size, it becomes extremely difficult to, lo uh, to dislodge you. No, it doesn't. Uh, it, it takes an external factor. It, be yes, it, it becomes does. vastly easier to dislodge you when you grow in size. Uh, you keep saying the economic calculation problem is overblown. How exactly is it overblown? Because it's assuming that it's the only limit on... It don't, uh, I don't assume that's story. the only limit. There are other oh. limits as well, but that is one limit. So assuming there are other limits, that makes my argument even strong. That makes my argument even stronger. No, because it assumes that when businesses grow, they don't benefit from economies of scale, that they don't benefit from being able to buy out business, that they don't benefit from being able to, to undercut opposite businesses. Uh, yeah, they, they, they can do all these things, but none of these things allow them to overcome the economic calculation problem. This is why Standard Oil was failing in the end. This is why they couldn't maintain their market share. No business has ever been able to maintain a free market monopoly. I'd like you to point me to a single example of a business which has maintained a free market monopoly. Across when? Define a time limit. Any time ever. Businesses, like everything, are temporary. Things eventually will fail. That's not an economic calculation problem. That's a human problem. That's a natural problem. 
things decay over time, but that doesn't mean decay over time. Why of that decay over time? Why? Why do they decay over time? That's that's the law of entropy. It's basically uh, entro entropy. Decay. Entropy applies to systems in physics. It doesn't apply to businesses. It doesn't. Entropy is not a problem in economics. We make things. Things eventually get destroyed, but through the period of somebody's life. That is a monopoly. That is a complete effective control. You can't say that it's not going to be self perpetuating Heck, okay, look at Disney point, right now. Point me Disney to another. Disney, a Disney are a monopoly because of IP rights. IP is not a legitimate form of property. IP is perpetuated by the state. Don't cite Disney here. Cite what you think <laughs> is a monopoly at any point in okay, time so why, where it, may, so why it might have been a temporary. Not, a why, hold on, hold on, hold on. Why is IP not property? Uh, because you can't homestead an idea. But their labor has been mixed in with this idea. They have put their labor into an idea and uh, created it. And I'm, I, mix, I mix my labor in with my own idea, which it happens to be exactly the same as theirs. Doesn't matter. You can't homestead and you can't homestead other people's brains, which is what you're doing with intellectual they have, property. They have created an idea. They were the first one to it. They have put their labor into it. That's theirs. Uh, no, but they, they, what they are trying to do is control other people's property. There. No, but you didn't come up with that idea. They come up with it. It's Doesn't theirs. matter. How can you prove that you came up with it completely independent? I have come up with the idea to only have red shirts. Uh, now nobody else is allowed to have red shirts. Do you think that's legitimate? I mean, that's a very bizarre example and doesn't nearly apply the same way. But why do doesn't it apply the same way? You have independently come up with a market with an idea that you're selling to someone. Let's product, let, let's say I I'm idea. let's say I'm the first person. Let's say, let's let's say let's let's say I am the first person to make a wheel. I am the first guy to make a wheel. Can I pass that idea down onto my son? And can he pass it down onto his son? And can it go down the generations so that only one family is ever allowed to manufacture wheels? Do you think that is legitimate? No, I don't. Why but not? That's how your but of it, no, 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 no. Because but if you, you own something, you can pass it on infinitely. Property does not have an expiration date. Why does intellectual property therefore have an expiration date? You don't agree with intellectual property. Nobody does. I think that intellectual property rights should have time limits on. Up but to a certain point, should yeah. actual pro should actual property have a time limit? Should after a certain point, I no longer own my house after ninety ninety years post my death? Should my house just seed back into the public domain? Do you think that is a legitimate thing? I mean, if you're looking for a communist future, that's not actually that bad of an idea. I should jot that down somewhere and stick it with my book in Marx. So, do you think anything should just seed back to nature that you own? No, I, I don't necessarily think so. so you it depends don't on agree with the society you're living on. With intellectual property, it depends on usage again, because as you said, people are mixing their labor into it. After a certain point, if something penetrates the market to such an extent that life without it has become unlivable or it's become widespread, that's the reasoning behind intellectual property that then other people can then use it because what? the person that has benefited from it is no longer around. That's not the same thing as, um, you know actual physical properties Let, let's say di topic, let's say disney what i'm saying that let's say disney keep using star wars property is not a good idea because there's so many diverse expressions and understandings of it if you don't have a general rule it's arbitrary a list your of idea of property is entirely arbitrary here if you don't have a general rule it's arbitrary by definition but a general rule that requires millions and millions of exceptions becomes arbitrary. It doesn't matter. I have no anything. exceptions. I have no exceptions in my general rule. You might have them in your general rule, but that's because you have an arbitrary rule. General rules that are so wide that they apply everywhere and nowhere are no longer rules. That is word salad. I mean, that is exactly what it is. If, if your rule is so vague as to apply to everyone, how does it then function? Uh, function. Able, How does it not function? Every, everybody has a rule. Everybody has the rule that they cannot murder people. Do you not agree that that is a general rule which applies to everybody? And yet it somehow functions. Who knew? Well, you've specifically qualified it with murder, but you're saying that somebody isn't allowed to kill somebody. That's the rule. But there are exemptions to that, aren't there? No, I didn't say everybody right should kill. I didn't say everybody is not allowed to kill people. I said everybody is not allowed to murder people. That is not an exemption. Yeah, that is not an exemption. No, that is the rule. On. The concept of murder 
is illegitimately taking somebody's life. That's not the same thing because that is then qualified. That is a okay. So so it all it all it all to kill people. it all draws back to you are not allowed to aggress onto other people. You are not allowed to aggress. Is the non-aggression principle? Do can you find any sort of inconsistency in the non-aggression principle then? Off the top of my head, I mean, oh, we'll come back to this. Um, with, I mean, let's take a look at it, shall we? The, the non-aggression principle is inconsistent because then you're talking in two different ways. So, you know, like uh, abortion. How does non-aggression principle fit with abortion? Uh, we don't know yet. It's uh, an open question. I'm personally an evictionist. But the fact that we don't know how the, the how the NAP applies to abortion doesn't mean that it doesn't. So you've just said you don't know how it applies, but it doesn't. Yeah, I don't know. That doesn't. Uh, and we also don't know a theory of everything, but that doesn't mean physics is wrong. <laughs> well, there we go. That's what I'm saying, that eventually there are qualifications. No, that's not what you're saying. I'm, I'm implying no qualifications to the NAP in saying that I am an evictionist. That is just my personal view that I think that is probably going to be the best path forward. The NAP itself, that is no, there is no inconsistency in the NAP. The inconsistency there is within our minds. We don't understand liberty enough to understand whether the NAP, uh, how it applies to abortion. And the exact same thing happens with physics. There isn't an inconsistency in the scientific method because we don't have a theory of everything. The inconsistency is in that we do not understand physics enough to know a theory of everything. So, you are saying that uh, we're with the NAP with ab abortion, you don't have the right to cause harm, but you are causing harm. Well, I, ne I never said fetus. you don't have a right to cause harm. I never said that. Well, but you're not. You're not. You're not being you aggressive. You don't have. You don't have a it. right to aggress. That is the only right. You. Do you have a right to not be aggressed upon? That is the only right you have under the NAP. Does that not extend to a fetus? It might do. We don't know properly. There are different. There are differing viewpoints. I'm not very. I'm not well read enough on abortion to give you a definite answer. Just as I'm not well read enough. enough on the Riemann hypothesis to give you an answer on that. Fair enough. Oh, I don't think I could probably solve the Riemann hypothesis. Yeah. yeah, well, let's, let's debate on the answer to the Riemann hypothesis. <laughs> oh, God, no. You, you'd win just because my maths is that poor. <laughs> no, it's, it, it, the, the thing is, everybody would lose because we don't know. <laughs> oh, right. How long did you put, put for this discussion? Because I am swiftly running out of time. Uh, I didn't have any specific time set up. We can stop it now if you want. Uh, I was I was actually in the middle of recording uh, the video that about my Monopoly paper. Uh, whilst, uh, while I looked at the time, I was like, oh shit, it's almost three. <laughs> I was rushing back. Um, I had some family obligations that I yeah. needed to take care of and I'd be rushing, rushing, rushing to try and get back for this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, Oh, bugger, I've actually missed um, a parade I wanted to watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let you get back um, to that then. It was a good no, it's it? fine. It's on YouTube. It's um, the the Egyptian museum's moving all the royal mummies across to a new museum they've built, so they're doing like a big parade. And ah. um, I was really looking forward to watching that, but I think it's on YouTube, so it's fine. I guarantee you, you will have missed it, and one of the mummies will have gotten up and like attacked the crowd or something. I wish... Um, that actually reminds okay, me of Okay, boys, guaranteed story, um... Hypatia's Lantern wants to see a mummy attack a crowd. <laughs> Look, I watched The Mummy in 1999. It's films, so I'm not going to deny that. <laughs> but if Ramesses got up, I would be running in the opposite direction. Yeah. Hey, it was a good discussion, um, man. It, yeah, definitely. I mean, I know we don't agree discuss things with people you have given me a lot to think about and i hope i've given you some stuff to think about as well yeah um also, i'm curious what everybody keeps saying hypatia has landed why is that i thought it was obvious that it was hypatia um i don't know i just uh i'm not like english i guess <laughs> i think it's a greek name from alexandria so i thought um 
that that would work, but it seems not. Yeah. I, I do have this problem where I seem to think that people understand everything I'm talking about when, when yeah. it sounds completely ridiculous sometimes. It's, it's quite amusing how far we got away from the uh, the contention of the debate, though. It was, yeah. about, it was originally about uh, the Second Amendment, and we got on to all sorts of stuff. <laughs> yeah, we flew off into a galaxy <laughs> far, far away. Uh, that's, that's, uh, I like it when debates just go completely off the rails. I mean, it's like a, it's almost like Godwin principle of debates that eventually <laughs> you'll end up with Nazis. Yeah, <laughs> eventually you'll start talking about Rupert Murdoch in any debate. Oh, Rupert Murdoch, I mean, he's such a really easy example to use because he's just there and everybody knows him. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it doesn't help he looks like a random scrotum either. <laughs> Yeah, man. Uh, I, 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 I'd love to talk to you again sometime. Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, um, people, um, I just actually had one with a Connor boy yesterday. I think you'd find him really interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, he's spoken... I've talked to him before. Yeah. Um, sorry. Did you say you had? Yeah. If, I, um, if on his YouTube, it's like a debate with anarcho capitalist. Uh... Oh, that's you. Yeah. I've been meaning to watch that one. It's on my. I've been such behind, so behind on everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was me. Um, I'm linked in the description, I think. Yeah, no, he, ah, cool. He's, um, I find the people in Econo Boys Discord tend to be fairly friendly. Yeah, I'm. I'm quite happy with that. Um, I mean, I like. I like to keep things friendly and civil, even when we disagree. The only, yeah. the exception to that tend to be Nazis, but. I mean, I I know I I do know a couple of uh, like. Don't know any proper like avowed national socialists, but I do know a couple like, you know, they'll post pictures of like. Horrible things. Yeah, I I knew quite a lot of EDL people back in the day. I used to debate them. Thought it was a good idea, but really it wasn't because there's no intention to debate in good faith. If you know what I mean. Hmm. It it. It's an odd situation, it really is. If if somebody doesn't come to the table in good faith, then there's no point to discussing with them because they're really using it as a propaganda point more than anything. At least that's what I found. Yeah, I mean, I've um, I've like just refused to debate a lot of people because there's no point if they're not going to be actually if it's just going to be a shouting match or anything. Like it doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I just don't see the point if you're not going to reasonably and rationally discuss ideas but i do think that it's probably a good idea to fix the terms of a debate uh, ahead of time so that people can stay on topic i mean we probably uh, should have done that it, it, it didn't work very well for us i think no oh i i actually hadn't prepared anything or read up on anything i literally just re reminded myself of the definition of the second amendment <laughs> red heller and a couple of the other ones from yeah. the past and that's it so you caught me completely on the hop <laughs> You yeah, know, I was uh, using uh, Emacs for my flow, so I publish my flows after debates anyway, so I can send that you that. Emacs, so you can see. What's Emacs? Emacs is like um, it does it just it does it a disservice to call it a text editor. It's like it it does everything basically. Like I I can't describe how good it is. Like it has this thing called org mode, where like it is the best like. It is great for note taking. It is great for making papers. I made my uh, uh, natural monopoly paper in Emacs. It is like a mate. You can it is an RSS reader. It is a web browser. It's just everything. It is it there is an Emacs extension for it? Like it is incredible. Well, just popped into Google and it it's bringing me up drone. So I don't think it's that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, the extension I use is Doom Emacs, and my uh, Doom config is on my GitHub. It's just uh, liquidzulu slash dot doom dot d, I believe. So, if it just pop me a link in the chat, I think that'd probably be easier than me faffing yeah. around on the internet on it. No, um... One thing that I found quite useful recently is uh, compression gloves just to sort of keep my fingers safe because uh, I've been doing a lot more typing with all this scripting that I do. 
I'm actually supposed to be making one on white privilege that's supposed to be coming out in the next like six or so <laughs> hours and I still haven't even started stitching it together. <laughs> God. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, I've been recording the, a video all day. Oh, those ones are terrible when the recording is just one set. Yeah, it's just, it's just, I have going over reading everything and then I have to edit it all together and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so it's been fun talking to you, man. I should probably go. Yeah, definitely. Oh, just, uh, I'm really having trouble placing your accent. Sometimes it sounds Scottish, is that right? Uh, yes, I'm Scottish, but I'm also half Irish. My mum's Irish, so. Oh, cool. Sometimes that'll come through. Oh, right. Oh god, I know a Scottish libertarian that I've ended up having loads and loads of argument. Um, god, this is gonna sound really awful, but you, you may have heard of him because I know he had a YouTube channel back in the day. And still don't know if he does. Um, oh, Scott Christopher something something. Oh, bugger! Don't think I don't know about him. Uh, the only. Only a libertarian YouTubers I know, but I know about Angle the Libertarian. He's like, I know him, like, because I'm on his uh, server and whatnot. Um, I know uh, Michael Moreno. He's quite cool. He's not, mm -hmm. like, he's like American, I think. Um, Bitbutter, he's really cool. Bitbutter is like, he does like these really nice animations for like libertarian topics. Like, if, if anybody you listen to this is like, libertarian even even you you should just check out like how high quality bit butter stuff is hmm. like he he does some very nice stuff i mean originally i was going to do animations for the stuff that i was saying on my idea how to make these animations yeah and i can't afford to hire somebody to make them for me <laughs> i'll tell you what you should look into blender blender is like what i used to edit all my videos and it's like free as in freedom like, it is all open source and everything. Like, it is the best video editor I've ever used. Like, I used to use a pirated version of uh, Filmora 9, but then it stopped working after the upgrade to 10. So I just started using Blender mm -hmm. instead. But, like, Blender is, like, it can do all sorts of crazy stuff. I use iMovie. I'm extremely high-tech. <laughs> <laughs> the on, only the best technology, the best production value <laughs> for Hypatheus Lander. Hypatheus, <laughs> rather. I, oh, I'm actually right. noticing now it is actually Hypatia. I thought it was a TH. Yeah, it's um Afro Greek philosopher uh, slash scientist from the third century, uh, Hypatia of Alexandria, who worked out that the um, the sun, well, no, the Earth is on an elliptical orbit, not a circular one. Um, she is a fascinating character and was sadly brutally murdered by some Christians in the Alexandrian riots, if I remember correctly. All sorts of shit was quite... lost in like. <laughs> God, yes. No, um, have you ever seen the podcast Fall of Civilizations? No, I've not seen that. Oh, you should watch it. It's great. Um, honestly, it's it's like it's the best production quality I've seen on a documentary for a long time. Like it easily rivals BBC on on their quality and just the the information they bring up and the stories they tell. Hmm. the The fellow's voice is a little dry. I, I won't say it's not, and it's, <laughs> it can be a bit soporific, but it's hella interesting. Uh, send it into the like uh, the DM so I can look at it later. Yeah, I'll drop that in. The only problem is that it takes like a month between episodes. <laughs> it's it's the worst thing just waiting for them, but it's great stuff. I've learned loads. Yeah. The Khmer Empire in Cambodia and Angkor Wat and bloody hell, that was fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I should probably get, uh, get going. We've said this about five times where we're trying to leave them. We'll get <laughs> yeah, back I'm, I'm horrible at just ending things <laughs> and saying yeah. bye, but yes, I will definitely let you go. Yeah, uh, so I'll see you later, man. Uh, we should probably talk again at some point.
Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm sure we can come up with plenty of topics to chat about and oh, disagree on and then <laughs> <Yeah>. float off. <laughs> yeah, so I'll see you later, man. It was good talking. Right. See ya, definitely. Oh, great guy. <laughs>